Hey everyone, and hey Vitaly, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for inviting. It's great to be here. So we have a few questions for you, uh, mainly focused around industrial robotics with Robonomics. So the first few questions uh, about you. Um, so how did you get involved with Robonomics? Yeah, so that was still when uh, Robonomics was a research project. Um, uh, centered around our lab and the idea of the research was that robots are becoming more autonomous operationally but there are no economic tools of how robots should be integrated into human economy so and that happened uh, when i met sergey uh, back in 2016 at the conference and he presented the results of the first stage of research of how a drone could be launched under Ethereum smart contract control back then. Um, and uh, back at the time, most of the presentation on that con at the blockchain conference were like about multi-sig wallets and just people were starting to learn about blockchains. And here's this presentation that is talking about economic autonomy for robots, which I thought is um, pretty crazy, but at the same time, um, really made sense to me a lot because uh, um, uh, the term of smart contracts was actually introduced by Nick Sabo in 1997 and it spoke about a lot of use cases about vending machines or car leasing similar to what um, the research was about so I, I thought that that's one of the actually better use cases for smart contracts that I've seen back then at least and uh, I definitely wanted to learn more and start helping out this research. And uh, then seven years later, uh, I'm now working with Urbanomics on um, spreading the word and uh, working on uh, industrial cases. Well, it definitely sounds like you uh, identified the possibility of Industry 4.0 quite early then. Um, yeah. Yeah. Could you uh, explain your involvement in the Robonomics project? What are you currently working on? Yeah, so I am evangelist at Robonomics and uh, I do public speaking a lot. So I tell other people about the possibilities of Robonomics, that Robonomics is a, essentially a secure and serverless uh, and futuristic IoT platform that any robotics or IoT developer can use uh, almost um, out of the box, pretty much. So if you're, for example, familiar with robot operating system, and that's a de facto standard in robotics industry, um, you can extend the capabilities of your ROS-powered robot with, with Robonomics and start accepting payments um, implement smart contracts for your robot to guarantee the execution of different tasks, record data securely in decentralized networks so that there is an immutable and transparent track record of every step that the robot does um, so that the process of audits can happen easier, for example. Um, so yeah, mostly I am talking to people about what's possible with Urbanomics and also um, I run the company called Merkelbot, which is uh, essentially doing uh, industrial implementations of robonomics and applications. Definitely sounds like you're helping to spread the word of robonomics. Yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of uh, my 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 goal as evangelist, spreading the word of uh, our um, economy of the future. I would say. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I see that you are involved in the Robonomics Academy and that there is a SPOT course. Could you explain a little bit about the Robonomics Academy SPOT course, if possible? Yep. So Robonomics Academy in general has the um, goal of educating people on the possibilities of using Web3 technologies in robotics and IoT. Um, and uh, it has uh, a course on home assistance or, or like your um, uh, for devices for your home and uh, making your home infrastructure secure. And also it has a course on Boston Dynamics Spot. 
Uh, we actually have purchased one of the robo dogs ourselves, and it's uh, permanently based in our lab in um, Bay Area. And anybody in the world uh, who wants to experience working with this ro most advanced ro robot in the world, actually, right now, uh, they can connect remotely to the robot and uh, either go through a set of lessons that we prepared that get you up to speed with the Boston Dynamics SDK programming, or they can actually develop their own applications if, if um, um, developers are excited about extending the capabilities of Spot. They can actually rent out time on, on, on our platform and then work with the hardware directly. It's very exciting. I actually tried the very first lesson of the Spot uh, course and I think a lot more people should try it out. It's really cool. Yeah. How, how did you like it? How was your experience? Uh, it was it was really cool. Um, like it, it was not that complicated, which was surprising. Um, I think even beginner people um, could really uh, participate in that course and get a lot of enjoyment from it like I did. Yeah, we, did, we specifically made the first lesson uh, as easy as possible to get people um, into robotics in general by interacting with this really cool robot dog. Uh, but then like later on, the lessons are getting harder, of course. So the whole course uh, would probably require some time and commitment, some time commitment. Um, but yeah, the first lesson, definitely anybody can try it out. And that's that was our goal. So that basically we can at least um, get anybody on board with our vision and uh, with, with uh, um, interacting with robots in general. That is the goal after all. <laughs> yep. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about the fourth industrial revolution and how that might look for people that maybe don't understand it? Yeah, well, I guess I, I, I should start by saying that, yes, we're entering the fourth industrial revolution. And for those who are surprised to hear that, the first was steam and second was electricity and third was basic controller based automation. And I think like that's my personal opinion that we're still primarily on the third uh, industrial revolution stage most of the manufacturing facilities or like uh, logistics centers they're more tend to be more traditional and um, even though you, they utilize robotics already for the past like 30 years maybe um, robots there are often not connected to the internet at all and they basically sit in this cage literally uh, blocked off from everything else and just do pre-programmed uh, um, trajectory every single time. I think what's different with the fourth industrial revolution now is that robots are becoming more connected uh, and their data starts to get utilized um, um, to improve the processes um, and to get direct access basically. So anything from um, computer vision and cloud-based uh, uh, calculations, for example, uh, that significantly increase the number of use cases that robotics could be used for, uh, to like ultimate vision of the fourth industrial revolution, I think, where um, I could imagine a world where I, from my computer at home, I can order a highly customized product uh done specifically for me and then this factory that is only operated by robots uh, they sometimes called lights out factories because they don't need any lights they're only robots right uh will manufacture this product specifically for me and then maybe even transact with a automated logistics company and like an autonomous delivery robot will bring this product to me so I think that's kind of the vision of the ultimate, the ultimate vision of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, but then components of it are already started to get implemented in our everyday life and our uh, in, in industrial sector as well. It's a very exciting time and it's good to see that parts of uh, parts that are going to make up the fourth industrial revolution are currently being implemented like right now. It's really cool. Yep. 
Um, so from your experience, um, kind of going out and uh, reaching out to people about robonomics, um, what are some current industrial use cases for robotics and maybe for robonomics specifically, uh, which are currently existing today? I would say that um, specifically for um, robonomics, the use case that um, we worked a lot on was digital passports for products. And um, here the um, combination of robotics and Web3 instruments is just uh, very clear. Um, the data that is captured by the robots um, on an assembly during an assembly process, for example, um, uh, is recorded on the blockchain, have a timestamp and well, immutable track record essentially. Um, and then um, people after after that can have a um, um, transparent record of what they went into their product. So we tested that on the medical device facility production facility. Um, and did smaller projects with food production, um, but it's um, it was more of an experiment. But we're really excited about these use cases because we think that uh, we definitely need more uh, transparency in our supply chains. Um, and um, technologies like robonomics can significantly improve that by connecting directly to the equipment that's doing the processing of the products that we are um, working on. And as we discussed before, most of this equipment is becoming connected right now. So having an infrastructure for them to record data securely, sign them properly with their keys and having wallets and things like that, uh, make sure that those devices are actually recording the data um, in a secure way as well, once they are connected. So that's kind of one of the use cases. Another one um, that um, I am particularly excited about is robots as a service. And I think most of robotics companies that I uh, know in one way or another are talking about robots as a service right now, because obviously um, that's an interesting concept. Instead of uh, getting upfront, um, um, instead in, in, so basically if we think of a factory that needs to get automation equipment, robots. Um, the, what they used to have to do is uh, to have upfront investment to buy all the equipment and then start getting their money back slowly over multiple years. Now with robots as a service, companies can offer robots to the company on an um, operational cost basis, it's, it's called. So basically they only have to pay monthly for, for the equipment and because we have this data and a way to um, securely pro um, capture this data, we can actually know exactly how much the robot is utilized, how much its amortization is happening, and all that uh, is recorded on a transparent um, and trustless layer with the help of Robonomics. So uh, I think that Robonomics is uniquely positioned to enable robots as a service use cases for other robotic companies. And um, I am very excited about robot as a service specifically. It does seem very exciting being able to lower the barrier to entry for like small and medium sized businesses. It, I think it will yep. really help to uh, drive adoption of uh, robotics technology. Yep, um, totally agree. Um, as as robots are becoming much more advanced in the even in the past five years, the advances in computer vision and autonomous navigation um, basically already uh, makes robots something like from the sci-fi world of the future, like from what we imagine. We already have it today, um, and robots are starting to get out of labs and research facilities into our streets. Um, so the more we see that, um, the more uh, we need to think about the economic tools of how those robots will be implemented, both uh, with companies that are acquiring them, but also how will they interface with people who are actually are the final users of those robots. It's really awesome to see, especially some of the uh, like delivery drones on streets. It's pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I think that, that too. 
So speaking of uh, kind of coming from uh, sci-fi, right? Um, what are some kind of use cases that you can see for uh, either robotics or robonomics um, in the next kind of five to 10 years? Or what would you like to see, even if it's a bit kind of wild? Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the, the wildest thing that came to my mind is a little bit creepy, but I'll still show it. Um, share it. So I've seen a company that is working on a butcher robot, and uh, oh, wow. <laughs> that sounds very scary and creepy. Uh, but at the same time, that's uh, um, actually a very um, technologically involved process. Like it's every piece of meat essentially is different. So yeah. the fact that uh, that the robot arm can actually cut out the meats from different components and see and detect in real time how the, the, the structure works and things like that. It's a very complex uh, task. And also the one that um, people tend not to like very much um, at scale. And it's hard to, especially after COVID, hard to um, f um, fill those positions because people didn't want to do those jobs. So I think that robots are actually um, best used in the positions where people don't want to do those jobs. They're either dangerous, hard, uh, repetitive, and boring, and that fits a lot. So now I think like this is kind of a, more of a scary use case, but it's very needed, I believe. Uh, but it also shows how robots can do tasks now that are very um, varied and uh, unique. So going to more like, um, I guess, less scary applications is, for example, e-commerce packaging. And we, we order so much things, uh, so many things there are different shapes, different sizes, and then those processing facilities for e-commerce, e um, um, they are um, increasingly more automated as well. And robots there are trained to pick different shapes and sizes of the products, pack them, like choose the boxes appropriate to the size and things like that. So we see much more advances in, um, the variability of tasks that robots can perform. And with that, uh, robots are actually starting to operate along people as well. You mentioned rovers that are driving in our streets, also like in restaurants. And uh, uh, we see, well, delivery robots like waiters, but also the cooking robots start to appear as well. Um, in hotels, obviously, their um, cleaning robots and commercial cleaning already used widely. So we see robots starting to appear in our everyday life. And um, I am excited about that, that um, basically I, we live in a world right now where I can pay already to the robot to deliver service to me. This is just something that... Uh, I wouldn't believe if somebody told me like even 10 years ago that that would be happening. Uh, but and now that with Robonomics, we actually make it happen in our everyday life. So, Yeah, science fiction is really coming to life, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's like you asked me about some forward looking statement, but I'm already like mostly sharing things that I exist right now. So I guess I'm most excited about in the next five years to see more of that happening because now like I see so much stuff happening in the labs um, and early startups working on that. I think in the next five, five to 10 years, all of that research will just flood our streets and our everyday life. And that's what I'm most excited about in robotics. It's very exciting times. Yep. So we have a few questions from the community that we can go through. Um, so the first, uh, the first four are from Mitch. So we'll go through them one by one. Um, yep. Coming back to the uh, the robot arm or the industrial manipulator, which we spoke about just now with the uh, the butcher use case. Um, <laughs> yeah. Another robot arm that has a slightly nicer use case is uh, Gakachu. So Mitch is wondering uh, when will Gakachu 
be getting back into operation? Yeah, that's a um, good question. So Gekachu is a painting robot. Uh, and uh, um, the developer of this robot actually forfeited all the rights to the uh, paintings that this robot generates. So this robot actually owns the paintings that it, it created. Um, so a very interesting example. Unfortunately, it's under maintenance right now. Um, and uh, usually it was operated uh, on specific amounts of time um, and then sold its art on the auctions. Uh, so it's more of a one-time thing and you just need to follow this robot um, Twitter. I believe it has its own Twitter. So follow follow the Twitter and then once this robot have an inspiration, it will create another series of works that you need to uh, wait for. <laughs> awesome. I think a lot of people are uh, excited to see Gakachu's latest masterpiece. Yep. Um, so the second question from Mitch is um, about industry robotics. Um, have you ever tested Robonomics with a real uh, automation line? If not, are you planning to collaborate with any company to do so? It would be interesting to see a system uh, system integration powered by Robonomics. Yep. So uh, we already tested Robonomics in uh, real world use cases. One was with assembly process of um, um, medical devices. A lot of the processes there were still involved manual labor and just were recorded with Rubonomics. And there the use case was for digital passports that I described. We also deployed um, last year a couple of robots as a service in actual warehouse in warehouses. So they were part of the automated line. Um, I don't think we uh, we had a scenario where the full out, uh, line was automated with Robonomics. Mostly, uh, until this point, it was uh, more sections of the line that we were experimenting, got given to experiment with. Uh, but we definitely are very excited to uh, come in and uh, um, automate the whole line as well and connect all the data and. Uh, enable operations for even a complete autonomous factory. So that's, that is something we are planning and we are talking to companies who um, are interested to experiment with that um, and always looking to meet more. So like if you are interested in that, if you have ideas or leads who would be interested to try Robonomics in their um, assembly line or like any, any process line in a factory or warehouse, we would love to talk. It'll be really exciting to finally see a full uh, automation or assembly line um, be kind of in the control of Robonomics or sending its yeah. uh, telemetry to Robonomics. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the uh, third question from Mitch is, can Robonomics help companies uh, to improve the maintenance of industrial robots? Maybe that's like maintenance planning or something? Yeah, um, in general, maintenance is a very um, difficult thing. Like you, you wouldn't think so, but uh, you know, in real um, in real life scenarios, maintenance could be um, people could forget to do it or forget on purpose to do it. Uh, with robotics. Uh, the maintenance logs would be uploaded automatically as well. And that's specifically important when, uh, for example, leasing scenarios are, or robots as a service scenarios are in place where the robot is owned by a financing partner, for example, and operated by the you know, warehouse or factory. There could be trust issues between the two. So with the help of Robonomics, uh, there could be a transparent track record available to both parties that the uh, maintenance was done correctly. Um, and then we could add uh, additional um, layers of protection. So like video feed of how the maintenance process was happening, for example, if needed or things like that. So yeah, I, I think that uh, with the help of uh, transparent tracking of maintenance process uh, and having a mutable track record of that on the blockchain, we can actually improve the maintenance process um, in industrial settings.
I think um, Robonomics bringing uh, improved uh, traceability and transparency in kind of a lot of areas of uh, the industrial process is a huge benefit for uh, these companies. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And uh, we are we are starting, as I was describing in the previous uh, answer, we are starting by doing the small projects for specific kind of niches. But really, yes, Robonomics could act as a um, value layer for uh, larger projects, even like uh, um, autonomous factory altogether, or even a smart city. So yeah, I don't think there is a, we can start with smaller scale with specific projects for maintenance or only or for robots as a service only, but then uh, expand and uh, um, improve the data processes for um, operations in different areas. Our final question from Mitch, before we go on to Ivan's questions. Um, do you think industrial robots can still evolve a lot? Hmm. Well, this is an interesting question because I see the most advanced uh, research projects already and I'm just uh, so impressed what we already have, uh, at least in research facilities. Uh, but I think that, yes, we can still advance a lot. Um, especially from the current status quo that exists um, in actual factory floors uh, across the country and globally. Um, we still, a lot of robots, as I was mentioning, are still not connected. Even though there, for the past, maybe even already 10 years, we see the trend of cobots or collaborative robots, for example. Um, robots that are safe to operate around people and they can actually work without a cage along a person, for example, and the person and the robot can collaborate in the shared space uh, safely. Um, still, I think the cobots market is smaller than that of more traditional industrial robots that have to be operated in a cage. Um, so I guess there is like this um, gap between what technologies we already have uh, and that exist in labs and those that are actually most widely implemented. There is a wide gap between the two. Um, so closing this gap, I think, uh, would be a lot of uh, kind of already a few steps of evolutionary process, I think. Uh, but then even further, I think there is a lot of um, things to be excited about. Robots are becoming smarter every single day and they can, can um, um, perform tasks and even at some point, I think, in the near future, will can be able to predict tasks that they need to be performing or things like that, more of like, it's already starting to use in lo with logistics robots, for example, those that are like operated by Amazon, for example, in a warehouse, they, they kind of plan the paths, considering other robots in their way as well, and optimize the planning on movements around the, fact, in the, around the warehouse there. So things like that, uh, I think, will be more um, exciting. So I think like the, what I'm most excited in evolution of robotics is uh, more of uh, algorithm and software. Obviously, hardware improves as well. And we saw, for example, Elon Musk announcing Optimus Prime robot that would be like a humanoid robot that could essentially do any tasks that a human would be able to perform with the hands and like de dexterous gestures and things like that. Um, but I think the biggest advancements and the biggest opportunities uh, would be unlocked by having better understanding of our environments and uh, having better machine learning algorithms, essentially. Well, that was a really interesting take. So we have um, six questions from Ivan. Um, yep. So the first one is, can you explain what the main Merkelbot product looks like? When you go to an industrial company, what do you show them? Uh, I mean, Merkelbot is a um, data management platform based on Robonomics. And also, like, we, we do specific um, 
uh, modules, I would say, that are necessary for s specific projects. And uh, right now, uh, the idea is that we can uh, re enable secure connection to your equipment. So if you need to connect either warehouse or factory or some your facility, uh, we enable secure connections using the private keys in Web3 wallets, and we use the Web3 infrastructure for that. But we abstract it away for the client so that for them, it's essentially a final solution. And uh, your access happens through their security extension, which is uh, a wallet in Web3 definitions, but for traditional industrial clients, it's more of a, like a security extension that manages your key and access. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then once uh, devices are connected, we enable secure data management. So if in case of a robot use cases in, in industrial settings, for example, we record the logs um, to again, um, see the, about the maintenance process of in case of robots as a service, we record data about utilization, for example, and to understand how much the company needs to be charged and how much usage they got from the robot. Um, and then um, this data can also be used in digital passports of products that uh, were manipulated by those robots as well. Um, and then obviously secure storage and archiving of that data, making sure that uh, this data remains available when it's needed, things like that. Um, so I would say a significant portion of the project is still uh, depends on the customer um, because in B2B cases, I would say none of them are completely 100% the same. Usually clients have their own specific environments, even though from the core infrastructure perspective, like our platform is pretty, pretty standardized. We, on one end, we connect devices and have um, a way to uh, connect most proprietary robots already from like cookers that are more traditional to Boston Dynamics that are really new, exciting robots as well as uh, open source frameworks like, like robot operating system. And on the other hand, we connect that to economics infrastructure and then different decentralized networks like Filecoin, for example, for storage and uh, making sure that um, the, 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 the user gets the complete solution, basically, that he can start using on day one. Wow, thank you for explaining, uh, explaining that. Um, so the second question from Ivan is, please tell us how you came up with the idea of smart leasing. Were there companies that complained about some of the issues that led you to this idea? Could you please share these stories? Uh, yeah, so I guess um, I hear that the most from robotics companies themselves. Um, and um, they see that from their clients because, uh, for example, in more traditional robotics use cases uh, with uh, automotive manufacturer, for example, it's less of a problem because they've been operating this equipment for the past 30 years. They have a really large scale for that uh, and large volume of production, which is very standardized. Um, so they have less of a problem with that. But then the more robotics use cases that start to appear that we were discussing, um, as robots are becoming more advanced, they can do more niche specific tasks in, in, in business, in small and medium businesses, and even in enterprises, they can fill roles that previously were impossible to automate with a robot. Um, and for those roles, uh, new business models make more sense. Um, they should be more flexible. And um, that's where I think the demand is coming from. And uh, for now, like I've talked to companies that uh, do rovers, for example, and they distribute them as a service. Um, we worked specifically with a company that uh, does um, algorithms for um, pick and place and repackaging in warehouses. So they were looking for um, as a service solution because um, the cost of the hardware was significant enough 
to um, make the decision harder to automate. But then when robot to the service was uh, offered to the clients, they actually were more willing to accept that because they didn't have to make upfront investments and their return on their in investment that they do on the first month they see the return straight away, basically, because the robot starts working and delivering value on a monthly basis as well. So that kind of makes sense for um, a lot of new applications. Maybe for more larger and traditional ones, things are sorted out there and there are ways for them to um, acquire hardware on their own. But then with all the newer robotics applications, I see robots as a service actually uh, it oftentimes is a critical part of the deal happening or not. It's really cool to be able to remove that kind of high capital requirement uh, for these companies to um, adopt robotics. And it sounds like it's working out quite well. Yeah, we tested it out at this stage and... Uh, um, another com part of that was a f actual financing. So that, that is an interesting way to actually, uh, that we're working on to give people access to participate in the robotics economy as well. So obviously, uh, we've been discussing how robots are going to make a huge impact uh, in our economy and, and already do, but it's, it's going to only increase exponentially. Um, and uh, we want to be able to share access to this value and to have more equitable approach to the introduction of robotics. So having um, enabling access to participate in financing of those on those uh, assets and actually getting the uh, return from the work of those robots, I think is very exciting. We're still working on that on how to organize that um, in an um, efficient, legal, compliant way. Uh, but very excited about this opportunity. I think that uh, there needs to be a way for people to get access to the value that will be generated by robotics economy in the next five to 10 years. Definitely sounds like there's a lot of value to add. Yeah. Um, so the next question from Ivan is maybe a bit technical. Um, so let's see. Um, how is the problem of disconnection solved uh, with smart leasing? For example, if the Wi-Fi does not work, um, because after all, the device must send its logs to the decentralized cloud. So if there's no Wi-Fi, how does that work? Yeah, it could be a problem for some cases. And with smart lease specifically, we operate uh, at least the, the projects that we did so far, we operated on a monthly basis. So like if there would be a situation where there would be no connection for the whole month, then um, that would be a problem. Uh, but luckily that's rare, rarely the case that you lose connection for the whole month. Uh, and, um, yeah, just having a small connectivity issues, uh, for even a day won't be an issue because, uh, um, basically like we charge the client monthly and operated on a monthly basis there, but then, yeah, it could be a problem if connection is lost completely. Unfortunately, we still need connectivity for that. Um, we could, uh, and like we had backup uh, connectivity as well and like f using 4G networks, but even if all of that fails, yeah, like still Robonomics requires connectivity of and as, as most cases uh, with modern implementation. Um, um, there could be scenarios where Robonomics could be operated in remote environments and uh, using some communication layers uh, that are like mesh networking or peer-to-peer and somehow connected back to the internet at some point. But yeah, basically connectivity is required. If we lose it for a small amount of time for a smart lease use case specifically, it's not that bad. Uh, once the connection is restored, we sync up everything and um, operations will, will not stop because uh, as long as the operations are authorized for a month, they will continue to happen. 
Um, so in that industrial case, we thought of that and we didn't have any issues with, with connectivity, even though connection dropped sometimes. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks for explaining that because I did not know the answer. Um, so we have another question from Ivan. Um, approximately how many companies have declared their interest in this uh, smart leasing product or service, sorry? Um, I guess I wouldn't share that for now. Um, cause yeah, we are still in the process of conversations with some companies. Um, yeah, I wouldn't tell it right now. No problem. Um, and the next question is, uh, have you spoken to Boston Dynamics about, uh, what we are doing with the spot robot or had any kind of reaction from them? or maybe the greater robotics community? Um, yeah, we, we uh, bought the robot from Boston Dynamics um, and we have a line of communication with them. We showed them what we are working on. Um, I think specifically for Boston Dynamics, um, we are excited about giving opportunity to more people to work with this robot. And I think that's what Boston Dynamics agrees on. Um, the more developers are, that start to use the platform, the more apps they can create, the more value the spot uh, as a platform itself can have for, um, for customers. So that's kind of our role right now. I still think it's my personal opinion that um, we're still at very early stage of uh, adoption for quadruped robots or like robots on four legs. They're called quadruped. <laughs> um, so I think we're still at early stage of adoption there. And uh, some really um, great use cases are already started to be implemented, like construction sites and infrastructure monitoring on large oil and gas facilities, for example. Those are really that are working great already. But I think the more developers that get access to the robot and start developing things, um, um, the more we'll have the use cases and the more uh, Boston Dynamics will get them. Um, so yeah, they are supportive of what we are doing and um, like giving access to um, developers to the robot and uh, shared um, equipment utilization essentially is the use case that we power for um, Boston Dynamics robots. Mm. And I think those use cases might be interesting to explore with uh, other types of mobile robots um, because with stationary robots, um, it's not like there are some cases, but it's not too likely still that the stationary robot would be, would be operated by different parties. Uh, usually it's deployed in one facility and it's just doing this specific task. But then with mobile robots, it's much more likely that multiple people will interact with it, do transactions with it. And that's, and, and essentially that would be, they would be sharing their access to that equipment. So, and that's where robonomics technologies, I think is uniquely positioned um, because uh, they can uh, securely track who is getting access can accept payments based on that access uh, and are operated on Web3 infrastructure that protects already protects billions of dollars worth of assets. So um, I think they're, they're secure for operating uh, industrial equipment as well. Yeah, I really think the, um, like the sharing economy for robots, such as what we're doing for Spot um, or other mobile robots, it's going to be like really large in the future. And I think the learnings um, that we're kind of uh, getting right now uh, with a lot of users in trying to interact with Spot at the same time could be like very valuable for that sharing economy in the, in the future. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with that. As, as all of our infrastructure is starting to get connected and essentially uh, most of the things in our real world are becoming what we call cyber physical systems. So everything has a chip and connected now. So like you, you would be able to transact with almost any device that you see right now. Yeah, definitely. So the 
very last question for this session, and thank you for coming again, Vitaly, is um, are you planning uh, any scientific publications regarding smart leasing or robot as a service in the future? And if yes, what will they be about? So we actually already planned, uh, well, we actually already published and peer-reviewed article um, on Robus as a service. Um, and that was more of an introductory article where we outlined what we have saw um, being developed on Robot as a service already. And we saw that most of the uh, development is happening using Web2 um, or like client server infrastructure, essentially. Um, and there we introduced the idea that peering technology or P2P uh, architecture could be um, better to enable robots as a service and um, robotics economy in general. And we like outlined um, early versions of um, uh, architecture there. Uh, and we, yes, we are planning to publish more on that. Um, Probably that in in our next article we should go deeper into um, the architecture described how exactly um, um, it should work, which technologies already exist, um, and uh, I'm going to describe the cases as well that we worked on. I think um, so. Yeah, basically. Uh, we we made the first step already published the first like kind of introductory article and our plan now is to go deeper into uh, um, outlining our our approach and why peer to peer networks um, are preferable for driving robotics economy i look forward to seeing those uh it sounds very interesting yeah that that was all of um, our kind of community questions. So, if if you had any kind of closing thoughts that you could share with the community, um. So, um, thank you so much for listening or reading through this. Uh, I am uh, really passionate about what robotics uh, is going to bring in the next five to ten years, and we have a specific angle of on economically autonomous robots and driving the. Um, transaction layer for robotics. Um, we are also particularly um, um, concerned, I would say, about security layer of uh, robotics. So we're making sure that um, uh, the um, infrastructure that drives this robotic economy would be uh, secure and um, hard to overtake completely. That's where um, I think peer-to-peer -peer networks should um, be paid close attention to because uh, um, that's where we can guarantee that even if local failures would appear, the whole robotics economy would not fail in any scenario. Um, and then uh, more on a pra more, more practical note, I invite all of you to try Robonomics Academy. I think that's a really, we worked on it for the past few months, um, got it to a point where um, it should be interesting for all of you to try and you can actually set up secure infrastructure for your home, make sure that you control your data and your access to your home is protected as well. Um, so we, we find it really um, um important for anybody operating any smart home device, really. Um, and also try Boston Dynamics uh, uh, course as well. Uh, I think you'll find it enjoyable. As somebody that has tried both of those things, the uh, Rebelnomics Smart Home implementation with uh, Home Assistant, um, it's, it's not that much more difficult or time consuming compared to just setting up Home Assistant. Um, so I would definitely recommend people do that. And at least lesson one of the Boston Dynamics Spot Robot course was, was pretty, pretty easy to comprehend and really enjoyable. Yep, totally agree. Well, thanks for joining us, Vitaly. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about uh, our progress and uh, get questions from the community. Great. We should definitely catch up again sometime. Yep. See you soon.